Hi everyone, welcome to Economics 2355. My name is Melissa. I'm a professor in the Economics Department and uh, for this course, which is on using deep learning methods to process economic data, I'm going to be pre-recording these lectures and so our time in class will focus on discussion and everybody should watch these uh, pre-recorded lectures beforehand to become familiar with the materials. Um, I'm also going to be making these publicly available in the hopes that they might help other economists who are interested in learning how deep learning methods may be relevant for their research. I know it's a bit weird uh, for me to be sitting here just talking to the computer, uh, but we're going to go with it and see how uh, this flip format uh, works for the course this year. Um, so let's delve right in. Uh, this is the introductory uh, lecture. Um, and Broadly speaking, the motivation for this course is that deep learning has revolutionized the processing of unstructured data. And by unstructured data, I mean things like text, images, audio, and video. These are types of data that would not be computable in their raw format. And this has in turn transformed a variety of disciplines, ranging from things like allowing NASA to land a rover on rugged Martian terrain, to changing how doctors di diagnose disease. Um, so while there have been a lot of efforts within economics to incorporate machine learning methods into econometric toolkits for processing structured data, deep learning methods have been used less frequently to process unstructured data in economics than they have been in many other disciplines. Um, and so if you're working with uh, structured data, you want to do econometric analyses, you're not generally going to use deep learning for that. Um, there's machine learning methods that are well suited to those applications. Those are not the focus of this course. Uh, what we are going to focus on in this course is using deep learning, deep neural networks, and We'll talk about what that means um, subsequently to be able to take unstructured data and convert it into a format that is computable that you can use for your downstream analyses. This is also not a course that's going to be about econometrics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about inference, but by and large in this entire literature, um, you will not see a standard error. Um, but really what it's about is taking this information, say taking uh, a, a text, um, taking a picture, taking a video, taking a satellite image, um, which in its raw format you cannot use in your analyses, and encoding that into something uh, that is suitable for whatever downstream uh, task, whatever downstream analysis you might want to perform. And so there's massive quantities of non-computable data that could power economic analyses if they were converted into a computable format. Uh, so let me give some examples. Libraries and archives have scanned literally billions of pages of historical documents. Um, those are in the format of image scans, which is essentially um, a series of X coordinates, Y coordinates, and pixel values, RGB values. Um, you can't take that and import that into R and run a regression, but if you were to uh, take that image and convert it into um, structured tabular data, then that could power your downstream analyses. Um, data can also be trapped in other types of images, things like satellite photographs or aerial photographs. Uh, text contains massive amounts of unstructured information, audio and video as well. And while the raw information is very different, um, say between text versus an image, the deep learning methods to convert these into computable information are very closely related, often drawing on the same underlying architectures. All right, so generally speaking, there are two distinct approaches to processing unstructured data. You could write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data by defining a series of rules. Um, and so in the case of um, digitizing tables, you might tell the computer how to detect its layouts um, by telling it to look for connected white pixels that separate rows and separate columns. Um, learning how to, you know, on the other hand, instead of writing the rules uh, that tells the computer what to look for, um, you could let the computer learn how to process the data by showing it empirical examples. Um, and this is what deep learning does. Uh, the model learns in this example that I gave to detect layouts by seeing annotated examples of what a table layout is. 
Um, and so rule-based approaches uh, have the advantage of being easy to understand. Um, most of us are used to interacting with computers via rules. Uh, they certainly have their place, but they oftentimes perform poorly, um, both in um, computer vision tasks, analyzing image data, as well as in natural language processing applications. Um, complexity and noise in general are the enemies of rules, and unstructured economic data tends to be rife with complexity and noise. So in the example I gave where you're trying to detect white space that separates columns and rows, um, suppose that um, your scan is a little bit skewed or a little bit warped. That might throw off your rule and you'll need to write an exception to the rule. Um, or suppose that there's ink bleed. Um, that again could throw off um, the rules that you've written and you can go down this really deep rabbit hole of writing exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions, even if at the end of the day, um, you're able to process the particular uh, set of um, documents or data that you set out to process, that pipeline that you designed is not going to apply to anything else because you've hard-coded um, so many things into it. And so what deep learning does is to learn a robust mapping between the input and the desired output. And so you can think of deep learning as an incredibly powerful universal function approximator. Um, in many economic applications, the inputs would be things like um, images, um, so x-coordinate, y-coordinate, RGB value at the pixel level, or they might be tokenized text, um, and so you take um, text and um, convert it into a series of vectors. Um, and the output is often uh, some high-dimensional dense vector representation uh, or encoding that powers downstream analysis. So what I mean by dense vector is that um, the positions of that vector are non-zero. Um, and so the deep and deep learning comes from the many layers in the neural network that maps the inputs to the outputs. Um, these models typically entail tens of millions to tens of billions of learned parameters. Um, the first question you might have is, what is a neural network? If you're not familiar with what a neural network is, um, on um, the web page um, where you found this lecture or on the syllabus, you'll see links to a lot of really great resources. Um, one of my favorites is uh, by Grant Sanderson, um, or uh, known as Three Blue One Brown, um, on YouTube, and he has these wonderful um, visual um, introduction to a neural network. Um, and how you optimize a neural network. So there's, in short, there's tons of resources out there. Um, I'm going to assume from this point uh, forward that you're familiar with what a neural network is. And so in deep learning, uh, the neural network has many, many layers. Um, and that network is going to map your inputs to the outputs. Um, and obviously, you know, for this to be something you need, um, there needs to be a pretty complex mapping between the inputs and the outputs, um, which is certainly the case with unstructured data like images or text. Um, okay, and so you might be asking now, how is this feasible? Um, first of all, how do we have enough data and economics to estimate a model that has, you know, tens of millions to even billions of parameters? Um, and the reason, you know, why oftentimes we do have enough data is that we use something called transfer learning um, to leverage pre-trained models. Um, so um, you may start with a pre-trained language model and um, an entity like Google or Facebook may have spent millions of dollars of compute pre-training that language model on a massive corpus of text that comes from like all the public domain texts on the internet. And so this model already basically understands how language works, um, but it might not understand kind of the idiosyncrasies of your task or of your data. Um, and so you can take that model and maybe it does good enough off the shelf. I'd say in our applications, typically we find that models don't typically do as well as we would like off the shelf, even if they kind of have okay performance. Um, but with a modest number of labeled examples, you can take this pre-trained model, which um, has been made publicly available, um, and you can tune it to your novel setting with a fairly modest amount of labeled data. Um, and so we're gonna see over and over again sort of examples of transfer learning in the course. It's actually incredibly rare, I think, that as an economist, you would train a deep neural network completely from scratch. Um, because even if you had a massive labeled data set, um, 
it's a lot of compute. Um, and most of us don't have access to, to kind of those kinds of compute resources. Uh, but fortunately, this field is pretty open. Um, and in both kind of the vision space, um, the language space, um, there's great pre-trained models that are out there and that exist. Um, second, you might say, well, how, how do you optimize a complicated nonlinear function with millions to billions of parameters? Um, and that's going to be a focus of this course, um, because if you want to be serious about using deep learning methods in your research, I think it's pretty important to understand what's going on under the hood, uh, because otherwise it's going to be difficult to know how to um, apply these methods appropriately. All right. Um, so computing has a long history in economics. Um, the advent of personal computing in the 1990s really revolutionized the discipline. It went from being highly theoretical to much more empirical. Um, and I'd argue that today advances in GPU compute and the availability of cheap cloud compute, again, have the potential to transform the types of data and questions that economists can study. Um, and so GPU compute is important to be able to um, estimate these kind of very large uh, deep learning models. And then with cheap cloud compute, you can take them and apply them to kind of millions and millions of images, for example, in parallel on the cloud for a reasonably modest amount of money. You know, I've you know, spent months um, running a thousand virtual CPUs on Azure in parallel. I'm not gonna have a thousand CPUs in my office, um, but they can be rented on the cloud um, for um, a, a fairly modest amount of resources. Okay, um, so broadly speaking, deep learning transforms the ability to process unstructured economic data in two ways. Um, it allows us to unlock traditional sources of data um, where uh, people who have used that type of data before, typically they would have manually digitized that information, but it's not feasible in your context because of the scale of the problem. Um, so this would be things like digitizing tables. Um, moreover, it can allow us to change the types of information that can be converted into structured data. So things that we wouldn't have even thought of as a data source before um, could become a data source um, if we have the methods to take them and to process them uh, for downstream tasks. And so um, today I'm going to briefly provide an example of each of these uh, types of applications. Okay. So first of all, processing traditional data sources at scale. So many central questions in economics, such as thinking about misallocation, inequality, social mobility, require disaggregated data. You know, you're gonna have a hard time thinking about inequality between individuals if you only have aggregated data. Um, yet it's quite rare to have digital disaggregated data over long periods. And the data that do exist are overwhelmingly from a few high resource contexts. Many of those contexts are concentrated in the historical US and historical Europe. Um, I have a long standing interest in East Asia's spectacular growth performance um, in the 20th century. Um, but efforts you know, that I made to try to understand it better with more aggregated data, so things even like municipal or county level data, um, were unsatisfactory because I felt like I really needed individual, like firm level data to know what was going on. And so when I first got interested in this, I thought, well, maybe you don't see these data used much because they don't exist. Um, actually, they do exist, incredibly rich from an individual level data stretching back to the early 20th century, um, exists in incredibly rich form for Japan, um, yet there's nearly 16,000 uh, uh, kanji uh, Japanese characters. Um, and so manual digitization, even if you get a Japanese you know, history PhD student to do it tends to be quite inaccurate because there's so many characters and most of them aren't in use today anymore. And moreover, the data are vast. Um, and so there's just not the human capital uh, to be able to digitize it by hand, even if you had vast resources, which I don't. Um, and um, people might say, well, take a sample. Uh, but as we know um, from many questions, such as questions involving uh, networks, um, taking a sample could lead to biases. And so this is an example of firm level data 
um, from Japan. These data are from 1957, and they contain information about the um, board members, the shareholders, the firms, the personnel, um, the balance sheets, etc. And so this is what the raw input would look like. Uh, this is a scan of a page of the book. You know, there's thousands and thousands of these pages, and then you have the books from multiple years, and so all together you have tens or even hundreds of thousands of pages that look like this, okay? So you're never gonna digitize this by hand. Even if you try to just digitize a little bit by hand, it'll be a huge pain because there's going to be a lot of mistakes. Um, we want to do things like tracing people across time. People's names have a few characters. If you get one of them wrong, you're not going to be able to trace that person across time. And so in short, you need a super high quality um, digitization um, of this, and it needs to be automated. Um, and so kind of stepping back more generally, this is an example of document image analysis. And so we have some document inputs, and then we're going to have some kind of pop pipeline. Um, and we want to produce structured output with that that you can then take and you know, import to statistical software um, and do your downstream economic analyses with. And so, um, you know, when I started working on this, there was really no full-fledged infrastructure for easily curating document image data sets and fine-tuning or retraining uh, the models to recognize the layouts of these documents. Um, the relevant resources, to the extent they did exist, were in different repositories and used inconsistent backends and APIs. And so just to give an example, maybe you needed to do some pre-processing and you could find something kind of helpful to do that in Java, um, but then to do the layout detection, you're going to need to use PyTorch. Um, and to do character recognition, maybe you um, use Tesseract and call that with C++, and then you need to do some post-processing, maybe you decide to do that in MATLAB, and then you also need to store the data. And so as you can see, this is convoluted. It's not going to be very reproducible for most people. It's not going to be very accessible um, to people who don't have a pretty strong uh, programming background. Um, and so what I did was to work with um, my pre-doctoral fellows, uh, Zhejiang Shen in particular, who really took a lead on this project, uh, Jake Carlson, um, and open source collaborators to integrate um, the models and tools that we were working on into an open source package called Layout Parser. And so the aim of Layout Parser is to streamline the use of deep learning in document image analysis pipelines, um, so being able to take documents and extract their layouts. Um, which you're going to need to automate the digitization of those documents. Uh, Layout Parser provides simple and intuitive interfaces for applying and customizing deep learning models for layout detection and other document processing tasks. Um, so we aim to make it as simple and comprehensible, customizable, extensible as possible, and it's also open source. Um, so Layout Parser has an off-the-shelf toolkit for applying deep learning models for layout detection character recognition and other tasks. Uh, this is supported by a repository of pre-trained neural network models that underlie the off-the-shelf usage. Um, it also has tools for um, data annotation and model tuning to support different levels of customization. Um, if your documents look different than the documents that the pre-trained models are for, which they probably will, you'll need to customize your own model and it has tools to do that. Um, and then um, a model hub um, and the library is implemented with simple Python APIs. Um, so it's straightforward to install. I will say if you want to install it, um, please use Google Colab. Um, definitely do not use Windows. Don't use Windows to do anything in deep learning. Just do not, do not try that. Um, the resolving dependencies can be pretty involved, and you will just make your life easier um, by, by using Colab. Um, and so this is an example of using Layout Parser off the shelf to recognize the document layouts of this PDF. Um, and so let me break down a little bit more detail what this code is doing. Um, we're going to specify the model configuration, which consists of a training data set name. And so the model is trained on empirical examples. Remember that what deep learning does. Uh, in this case, it was trained in a document called PubLayNet, which has um, PDFs, uh, PDF articles. Um, and, um, and then uh, there's the model architecture name. Um, in this case, this is using something called Masker CNN with 50 layers um, in the neural network. Um, uh, the model initialization, which has a back end. In this case, it's using Detectron 2. 
um, which is a backend from, uh, from Facebook, and then you uh, have the standardized model detection API. So if you want to make some changes, um, now I changed the model to something called faster RCNN. You know, we'll talk about what all this means later in the course uh, when we talk about um, document layout analysis. I changed the data set it was trained on to Primo, which is magazines. I changed the, changed the backend to paddle detection. Um, which is just another kind of set of uh, software for uh, doing object detection. Okay, so this is an example um, of our pre-trained um, model zoo. You know, of course, your documents may not look like these documents. Um, and so when you're using layout parser, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Uh, how different is your target data from the pre-trained models? What are your accuracy and efficiency requirements? and how much training data are available. Okay, so um, in kind of one scenario, um, your data look a lot like one of the pre-trained models and you care about things being efficient, well then you can use it off the shelf and you might wanna use the efficient backend, which may come at some cost in terms of accuracy, um, but will be very cheap to run. On the other hand, your data might look really different uh, from the pre-trained models um, and you might need things to be really accurate, um, which is a common scenario with academic research. Um, and there's no labeled data available. In that case, you're going to need um, to create some labels. Um, and so kind of we, we, um, we bundled um, uh, we bundled a layout parser with Label Studio, but you know by this point you're also probably better off just going and downloading Label Studio, which is another open source software since it's been kind of updated since then. Um, and you can use it to create kind of the, the labels like those that you see on the screen that is telling, um, telling the model what you want it to learn. Um, and so in the case of this newspaper here, you see we've told it to learn individual headlines and articles and um, pictures and captions and the header of the newspaper. All right, another thing that we're going to cover is like you might not want to just label at random. If you think about um, a distribution of different types of layout objects on your page, um, you know, there might be very common objects in the center of your distribution and then your distribution might have long tails. And ideally, you'd like to have your labels um, represent that full distribution. You don't want to, if you just sample at random, you're going to get too many labels from the middle of the distribution, which means you're going to waste your, your effort creating labels where you already have enough information for the model to learn from, and you're not going to have enough labels from the tails. Um, and so uh, we'll be talking also in this course about active learning, um, which is an approach um, that you know, potentially allows you to to, um, um, to make better use of your annotation efforts. All right, um, Layout Parser allows you to call Google Cloud Vision or Tesseract um, and use them off the shelf. Um, it allows you, um, uh, as you can see here, to visualize uh, your OCR output. Again, you can do that with a few lines of code. Um, it also allows you to export the data to different formats like JSON and CSV. Um, and it's built with an API where you can visualize um, the document layouts on the original document. Um, and you can visualize the location of the OCR text on the original document. And so coming back to the motivating example I gave you, um, these are rows um, from those Japanese books. Um, and you can see um, that we use this um, to detect um, different types of content in the documents. We detect different types of columns and then we de to detect different types of segments, which are like individual pieces of information. And so the red is um, title, the yellow is address, or uh, sorry, the pink is address. Um, and then uh, the other pink is variable names, the green is variable values, the blue is numbers. Um, and this is all done kind of using, um, using Layout Parser, um, which calls a, a model called MaskRCNN um, that you know, was designed for recognizing objects in natural images, you know, so finding cats and dogs and that sort of thing, um, but can be very readily applied to document images to identify different layout objects in your document. Um, and we need this information, right? If you just fed this to OCR, you wouldn't know which piece of information was which. And so in order to extract the structure from these documents, we need to know what's a title, 
what's an address, what's a variable name, what's a variable value, etc. Um, and the layout analysis, um, which is backed by deep learning, allows us to do that. You know, the, this pipeline was a particularly challenging one. Um, the Japanese documents um, use thousands and thousands of um, kanji characters, most of which are no longer in use, and some of which are very similar to each other. We tried existing OCR solutions, they just did not give us anywhere near the accuracy required for downstream analyses. Um, and this is a pretty widespread problem with historical documents, and it's especially a widespread problem in historical documents that are not kind of in um, very high resource languages, um, like English and other languages using that Latin alphabet, when you kind of extend beyond those, the quality tends to deteriorate. Um, and so we thought, well, um, we can um, just create some labeled data and we can tune an existing OCR model to this application. Um, but the problem here is that um, OCR traditionally uses an architecture that we'll see in the course called sequence to sequence, um, where you jointly learn um, a vision, the visual features of document, and a language model. And so the problem with this is that it takes a lot of data to jointly learn a language and vision model. And um, it's very costly to create the labeled text sequences that we would need for the model to jointly learn um, the visual appearance of the document, as well as how characters are used in sequence to form language. Um, and we just didn't have, you know, the, the resources um, to create that number of labels. Um, and so I worked with um, Jake Carlson and uh, Tom Bryan, who is the TA for the course, um, to develop a novel character-based OCR um, that um, really comes full circle with how people originally conceptualize OCR, and that it just focuses on the visual appearance of individual characters. Um, and so this is comparing our model, which we call FOCR for efficient OCR, to a traditional sequence-to-sequence -sequence OCR, which is what um, dominates in the literature. And so what FOCR does is we pass it uh, lines of, of data, and it first of all recognizes the individual characters. That's called localization. It uses the same methods that I was telling you all about with layout parts, so the same methods that are used to doc to detect the document layouts, we can use those to detect individual characters. And then we pass those individual characters to a recognizer, which has been trained to take characters that are the same character, even if they use very different fonts, even if they have a very different sort of appearance with the background and noise, etc., and take characters that are the same underlying character and map them to the same location, map them nearby in a dense vector space. And characters that are different, it, it's trained to map them further apart. Um, and so if you have two uh, A's that are written with very different fonts, it's been trained to map them um, nearby and to map, you know, an O and a C, which look sort of similar, but are not the same character further apart. And then we just OCR that document by taking these dense vectors, which are 768 dimensional vectors, and finding the nearest vector um, from an embedding index that we, uh, you know, created with a single font. Um, and that's how we OCR. We localize the characters and then we recognize what they are. Sequence to sequence, Instead, first of all, you pass your line of text into um, a visual features extractor and um, it outputs embeddings. These do not correspond to characters. There's nothing about this architecture that recognize characters. Um, it will essentially just um, you know, uh, create um, dense representations of, um, um, of this line of text and then it will pass those sequentially to a language model. Um, which will um, then output the characters. Um, and so um, FOCR does not have a language model. That makes it much, much more efficient to train because just like children learn how to recognize their letters before they learn how to read, um, it's much easier to learn the visual appearance of characters than it is to learn language. Um, 
We train localization and recognition separately, which is also a big advantage because you might just need a few labels to train the recognizer and then some more labels for recognition or kind of vice versa. So for Japanese, it's really easy to learn where characters are because they have similar aspect ratios, but it takes a bit more data to learn um, to recognize the characters because there's a lot of them. Whereas for English, characters have very different aspect ratios, and so it's a little bit harder to learn to localize them, but it takes really very little data to learn how to recognize them because there's not many characters. And so these are benchmark data sets that we evaluate on. We, you see here we have Japanese um, written horizontally and um, vertically. Um, and we have both Japanese prose and Japanese tables, and then we also have um, U.S. historical newspapers. And so these are pretty diverse documents um, because we wanted to really test um, how FOCR applies to diverse um, settings. So we create benchmark data sets um, with a fairly modest number, number of labeled lines and characters. Um, and we do this for each of the four data sets that you just saw. Um, so really it's anywhere from you know, a few hundred to a little bit over a thousand lines, where lines are like lines of a single column in a newspaper or individual cells in the tables. Um, and so it's really quite a modest amount of data. Um, our baseline results, um, we find very, very accurate results. Um, our character error rate is under 1%. Um, for the tables, it's a little bit higher for prose because we intentionally chose documents that were low resolution, where in some places they weren't legible without language, um, in order to have a context where you might think that there would be an advantage to sequence to sequence. Um, you see here that there's three lines of this table. That's just different versions of our model. I'm not going to talk about those differences now, uh, but we'll come back to this after we've seen um, different models. So one important thing here, though, is that the, the, the very small parameter, um, the, sorry, the very small model, it only has 9.3 million parameters. This is a deep learning model meant to be run on mobile phones, and 9.3 million parameters is really, really small for a deep learning model. It's doing like almost as well as the much larger models. This is an example of kind of different errors we make. And you see that when FOCR gets it wrong, it's generally like, you know, um, you, you can see why it gets it wrong. It's actually, you know, um, pretty hard to distinguish um, the correct match, which is in column one, um, from the prediction. Sample efficiency. Um, how well does the model learn? Um, and so we look at splits of our training data as small as 5%, um, which in the case of the newspapers is under 100 labeled um, rows of data. So really very, very small training sets that you could label in an afternoon. And the model is already very accurate. You see FOCR is the orange. There's some comparisons here. Again, we'll come back to what those mean after we've kind of introduced the background that you need to understand what these different models are doing. And the bottom line is FOCR is more accurate and it learns very, very quickly. Um, we compare it to other solutions. Um, and so these are kind of um, Google Cloud Vision is the main commercial solution. Baidu is like the main commercial solution for Asian languages. Um, Tesseracts, the open source engine, these are used off the shelf. You can see that Google Cloud Vision actually does really, really well on the newspapers. However, we're feeding it individual lines. Um, and if you feed it the full documents, it gets really confused about the layouts and does quite poorly. And it would cost something like $28 million uh, dollars to feed it individual lines from the collection of newspapers that we want to digitize, which is obviously out of the question. And so getting this accuracy is not kind of practical in the real world. Um, on the Japanese data, it kind of just especially the, um, the vertical Japanese, it does pretty horrible. Um, the vertical Japanese tables, FOCR is getting only you know, a uh, half a percent of the characters wrong, um, whereas the next best alternative, which is um, Baidu, is getting like 55% of the characters wrong. Um, and we can look at other models that are either trained from scratch or where we take their pre-trained model and fine tune it. Um, and we're still by and large uh, beating out these models. Um, Another important thing um, that will also come up um, for you guys if you want to process data at scale is you care about how fast the model is um, because um, you have these really large models like TROCR um, is a 
uh, sequence to sequence transformer OCR model. It did pretty good on the English, um, but it is extremely slow to run. So it's probably going to cost you too much money if you have a lot of documents. Um, whereas FOCR, the small version is actually quite fast. The only thing that beats it out is a um, a product called Easy OCR, which is, is much smaller, um, but at some cost to accuracy. Um, and, you know, so we very much developed this to process like actual important social science documents at scale um, and to be able to be both very accurate and affordable. Um, it's highly extensible. All that you need to extend FOCR to a new language is digital font renders of that character set. Um, we're also going to be extending it to handwriting, but, you know, kind of using a similar approach, but we haven't done that yet. It solves key problems with OCR of low resource languages and in endangered languages. It's very sample efficient. You don't need to see characters in sequence. You can mix and match character sets, um, etc. Okay. And this is kind of part of a broader goal I have to make digital history more representative of documentary history. And so historians think, of, you know, historians spend a long time thinking about how um, the documents that let, get left behind are not representative of humanity, which is certainly true. Um, but even beyond that problem, the documents that do exist that get digitized are not representative of documentary history because they're skewed towards a few high resource settings um, that are not representative of the documents that, that exist. Um, and that leads economic research, I think, in particular to be skewed towards those high resource settings um, because we need data and OCR errors are also really costly in data. If you, you know, mistake a one for a three, you're, you know, it, the number could be way off, right? So we need very accurate OCR. Um, and um, so the model architectures that exist, they've been heavily tailored towards commercial applications and wealthy economies, and they're often poorly suited towards low resource settings, which tend to be kind of disproportionately kind of in developing countries, Asian economies. Um, and so another central aim of my research is to make digital history more representative of documentary history um, by using deep learning. Um, and this course is going to take kind of, you know, this angle, right? If we were developing a commercial OCR, it might look quite different because we'd be focused on OCRing receipts, um, which is the main commercial application. Um, whereas the focus of this course is gonna be really on kind of using this for academic research. And an important part of that is you, that you can take these tools and you can use them in lower resource settings that are not large commercial applications, but that are important for, um, for human knowledge. And so I think that that gives us a very kind of different perspective than most of the development in this field where really there is a lot more of a focus on those commercial applications. Um, and so I think actually deep learning is incredibly powerful for lower resource settings, but it's important to come at it with that angle. And this is like one of the reasons why it's important to actually understand what's going on. Um, because if you have a lower resource setting, it might suggest kind of a very different approach than what's used by the off the shelf technology. Um, one final kind of thing I want to say about this point of, you know, uh, digitizing and working with tables is that uh, for many tasks, um, OCR, even if it's pretty accurate, can be an information bottleneck. Um, and we've gone through kind of, you know, um, this work to locate individual pieces of information in the document. You know, we could actually directly use those image crops for downstream tasks. Um, and so one of those downstream tasks is record linkage, overwhelmingly the way record linkage is done is to OCR the content. And then once the content is OCR, you use string matching techniques um, in order to, to, to link records across documents. Well, even if you have a fairly minor OCR error, as shown here, um, that can really complicate your record linkage. Um, instead of OCRing it, in fact, you could use object detection to localize the crops of where those entities are mentioned in the original document. So in this picture, we have one document that's written uh, horizontally in Japanese and one that's written vertically. In the horizontal document, we have lists of the customers and suppliers of each firm. And in the vertical document, we have more information about all those firms where we can learn their characteristics, 
we can localize the segments that contain the firm names um, and then use a deep learning model to say which of these are the same firms and which of these are different firms um, and just cut out the OCR bottleneck altogether and achieve a more accurate uh, record linkage. All right, um, so that's processing kind of traditional da data sources, in this case tables. If this isn't making a lot of you know, a tremendous amount of sense right now, that's fine. You know, we're going to go over all these methods in a lot more detail, but I just want to give a sense for sort of for what can be done. Um, the second thing you can do is just create completely novel types of data. Um, and so for this example, I want to talk about historical newspapers. Uh, we've used deep learning to extract structured text data from over 50 million page scans of historical U.S. newspapers. Um, this means we have extracted over a billion objects um, from historical newspapers where an object could be like a headline or a caption or an article or an image. Um, when processing is complete, we will be releasing um, all of this data that is in the public domain. Um, this is something that Tom, who is the TA for this course, has been working very intensively on. Um, and so once we have that structured text, we can use state-of-the-art NLP methods um, in a on those headlines, on those articles, captions, to create a variety of data for downstream analyses. And so if you were to take a historical newspaper scan and feed it to Google Cloud Vision, which is what we use to make this figure, almost always it's gonna read it like it's a single column book and everything's gonna get, all the words are getting all scrambled up. Even if the layouts are pretty simple, it's gonna get very confused. The words are scrambled up. Some of them are missed altogether. Some of them are detected twice. And so if this is what your output looks like, um, Pretty much all you can do is like a keyword search and say, you know, up to OCR, did this word appear in this document? And that's overwhelmingly what the literature on historical newspapers does, um, because that's the format that the data is in. Um, but using deep learning, we can actually do a lot more than that. Um, and so we can, first of all, recognize the document layouts um, using the same methods I was talking about with the tables. Um, then we can use OCR, so specifically use FOCR, which I just showed you applied to the Japanese tables, but we can use it to historic on historical newspapers. Um, we can use deep learning um, to um, infer the, um, which are pieces of articles go together, right? Because an article can span multiple columns or multiple pages. Um, and then finally, we can take this and we can use that information for downstream analysis and deep learning powers all facets of this pipeline. Um, so this is an example layout um, where we've detected the layouts of this newspaper. So you see the yellow is headlines and the pink, the, that bright pink is a table, the green are articles, the light pink is a caption, we have the purple is an image, and the blue at the top is the title of the newspaper, etc. Um, so what can we do with the digitized content? Um, we can use deep learning methods to retrieve content from a database of hundreds of millions of articles with robustness to complex vocabulary and noise. And text retrieval is gonna be a topic we cover. We can also retrieve images. Um, image retrieval is going to be a topic we cover. T topic classification, uh, what is this talking about? Again, we're gonna cover that. Entity um, uh, recognition and disambiguation. So which of the words in this document are named entities? And which named entity is this? If we see, um, you know, Senator Kennedy, is that Senator John Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy? Um, it could be, um, you know, if we see John Kennedy, it could be John Kennedy Airport, John Kennedy Elementary School. We can take all of those and say, which of those mentions refer to the same entity? And we can also link them to Wikipedia, if they're in Wikipedia. Again, a topic we're going to cover. Um, detect which of these um, articles come from the same news story and detect the reproduction of content. And so in U.S. newspapers historically, over half of all content was not written by local newspapers. It was obtained from a newswire or from a syndicate service. Um, and um, so these are all applications we're going to talk about. I want to briefly talk about the last of these applications here. Um, and so uh, media historian Julia Watanari um, wrote, by the 1910s and 1920s, uh, most of the articles that Americans read in their local papers had either been bought or sold on the national news market. This constructed a broadly understood American way of life that would become a touchstone of U.S. domestic politics and international relations throughout the 20th century. Um, and so we wanted to detect which articles come from the same underlying wire, newswire, or syndicate source in a context where 
Um, there's heavy abridgment. So uh, newspapers would edit down the articles to fit into the space they had. Um, and there's also noise uh, from OCR. And so what we discovered is despite being important for a range of deep learning applications, text deduplication methods are overwhelmingly rule-based and they lead to pretty poor results. And so um, with um, Emily um, Silcock and Luca de Amigo Wong and Jilin Yang, um, we developed deep neural methods to detect reproduced articles. Um, and this is a um, um, work that I'm gonna briefly talk about now. And so, we train a model to detect which articles come from the same source um, in this context that's rife with abridgment and OCR errors. And so what the model aims to do is learn a mapping from the raw article to a dense vector representation of that article, where articles from the same source are nearby and articles from different sources are further apart. And so this is like essentially the same um, the same model in some sense as FOCR, which you just saw. And so this is a type of problem called contrastive learning, which again, we'll have a lecture on contrastive learning in the, in the course. Um, and so just like FOCR was um, learning, okay, these two characters have different fonts, different noises, but they're the same. So I wanna push their dense vectors closer together. Whereas these two characters look pretty similar, but they're actually different characters. So the model should push their, their dense representations further apart. We're doing the same, kind of the exact same thing with the news articles. These are the same articles, even though one of them was abridged or has OCR noise, push their representations close together. And different articles push them further apart. Once we have those representations, we use single linkage clustering um, on those dense representations um, to extract article clusters. Um, we can also add a re-ranking step that um, jointly um, feeds these articles through the neural network and classifies whether they are the same or not. Um, and so this is a training data um, that, that we assembled uh, for this project. Um, and so you can see we actually in the full data set have quite a few positive pairs, so articles that are the same. Um, and a big part of this data is evaluation data. So um, for four days in the 1930s, 50s, and 70s, um, uh, we labeled every front page article that appeared in the hundreds of newspapers in our database to say which of those came from the same wire source and which came from different wire sources. And we had fantastic um, research assistants um, who worked on putting together these data, which allow us to really evaluate how we're doing. In this context, it's actually fairly unique. Because of the timely nature of news, we can get all the duplicate articles, whereas that would be harder um, in, in a context where you didn't have that structure, because obviously, you, you know, you can't label an entire massive corpus. Okay, so with these unique data, so we're evaluating this on those full days where we are confident we've labeled every article that comes from the same source. Um, and we look at neural methods and non-neural methods, which we'll also discuss. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail now about what these are doing, but I more wanna just illustrate the power of neural networks. And so uh, this is reporting the adjusted RAND index. Um, and you can see the neural methods, you know, it ranges from zero to 100, um, where 100 is the best uh, that you could possibly do, and the neural methods are doing much better than the non-neural methods. Um, this is a pretty significant difference. Um, we want to say, is this scalable? Um, and so this kind of blows my mind. Um, so we take 10 million articles, and first of all, we have to create those dense vector representations, which is called embedding articles. On a single GPU, that takes about eight hours um, to feed each of these 10 million articles through this neural network to get its dense representation. Then we have to compute similarity, and that is 10 uh, to the 14th calculations because we're comparing 10 million things to 10 million other things. And yet with this library called Facebook AI Similarity Search, you can do that on a single GPU card in about three hours, just mind blowing. And then the rest of it's trivial. Um, you know, it's hashing, which is kind of a fast method for a rule-based comparison of text. You know, it's, it's, it's faster, but not kind of appreciably so. Um, and you can see that with the hashing approach, um, the uh, mean number of times that an article is reproduced blows up um, when you apply to 10 million, whereas with our neural approach in the top row, um, 
an article on average appears in six newspapers, which is nearly exactly the same as it is in our labeled data, um, which gives us uh, confidence in the neural approach. All right. Um, so again, I know I've gone over this kind of quickly. I don't expect people to understand all the details, but I wanted to give kind of a flavor before we spend a lot of time delving into the methods of what you can do with these methods. So to conclude, uh, deep learning provides powerful tools for processing unstructured economic data, text, images, video, audio, and oftentimes what you do is you take that raw information, you create robust representations uh, for downstream analyses. Um, and becoming familiar with these methods, how they apply to economics, how they can be implemented and debugged can entail really significant startup costs. I certainly um, spent and probably wasted a lot of effort becoming familiar with these methods. And so my goal for this course, for these videos, is to make it easier um, to study questions you find fascinating and meaningful um, using deep learning to you know, either create data that it would just be too costly to do it manually or that you know you wouldn't have even thought could be data before, and that includes in low resource contexts. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the rest of the course um, as I have a chance to complete these videos. Um, they'll be uploaded to the Canvas site as well as uploaded um, to my website. Um, so thanks everyone, and I'll see you in class on Thursday.